All right, welcome back to another landscape from Lizard Landscapes. We've got the moon. So this was a fairly easy project. Uh, even created a little prototype with the project. So I would consider this to be like an intermediate project. Didn't have to deal with any resin, so that's always easier. So created a little uh, prototype for it there. You can see a little size comparison. It's so always good to have a prototype. I've used this uh, idea in uh, earlier projects where you're kind of working out all of the bugs first on this smaller project that's not as time consuming. So let's go ahead and get started in creating this moon project. So you always want to have some sort of professional dust mask, gas mask. Uh, to protect you from the dust and the fumes. So I've got a pencil compass. I'm going to draw out a perfect circle. This project wound up being uh, similar to the size of like a volleyball, just a little bit smaller. So I am near an open window because I'm using some hot wires from the hot wire foam factory. So I'm using that uh, professional dust mask or gas mask and I'm near an open window. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out. And I'm gonna trace around it and make at least one uh, the exact same diameter. I'm gonna cut those out. And I've made a whole bunch that are smaller as they get towards the top and the bottom. And the mistake I made was that I made those pieces too small. So one of the benefits of watching these videos is you can learn from my mistakes, uh, which I will show how I corrected that issue later. I'm going to go ahead and uh, glue all of these pieces together. So two of the pieces are the exact same size, and then they get smaller as they go up and down. Another mistake I made is that I did not put enough glue in the center. Uh, the idea being that usually you want to avoid having to cut through glue with a hot wire because it's very difficult when the glue dries. But uh, I did not add nearly enough glue. I really should have put some glue on the sides there, but I'll show you how I corrected that as well. So gluing all of these pieces down... And I think I waited these and then uh, waited a good week. Just did something else for a week. But again, those pieces towards the top, not big enough. So here we've got the prototype, just using four pieces. And I've waited for that glue to dry. And one method, you can use a hot wire, but you can also just use a knife and trying to carve into this with the attempt to uh, create more of a spherical shape. So it's looking a little bit more like a sphere. But quite a bit of work to do yet. And you can always use a razor blade to uh, remove smaller pieces really just trying to get it ready to the point where you can take sandpaper to it. I'm trying to get rid of those big chunks. So going ahead and taking a knife to the main project, taking a hot wire to it, just trying to get rid of those big chunks before I use a very heavy grit uh, sandpaper. So it's looking a little bit more like a sphere. And I've noticed that even after a week, it's not quite dry and I need that to be perfectly dry. So I'm moving around or I will be with uh, some sandpaper. So I'm gonna add some more glue 
and just wait this out. And after a week, it was perfectly fine. It's totally uh, dry and stable. And I've got towards the left lower part of the screen a uh, vacuum cleaner attachment set up, just ready to catch all of that dust from this uh, sandpaper uh, job. Also got the, the dust mask, but I'm using a very heavy grit sandpaper and trying to uh, get rid of uh, those big chunks. As you can see, there's large gaps left behind that I will show how I filled those in. So when working in uh, or with the prototype, it's got some gaps, got some gouges I need to fix, but it's coming along to the point where it's really looking like a little sphere. And I've drawn in where the dark spots on the moon are. I'm just taking a ballpoint pen and now I'm testing out like how to create those craters. So even though it, it is a much smaller scale, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, go about creating these craters. Got different size things. I've had a, what you just saw was a nail and then I've got a pin. So using the head of a pin and uh, using a paper clip. So kind of uh, pulling that apart and seeing how that works as far as creating all these craters. You want to have a variety of shapes. But the great thing about the XPS foam as opposed to the EPS is it kind of holds its shape much better and uh, lends itself in this case to uh, creating craters a little bit easier. So I've sanded down the main project. You can see it's still got some major problems with uh, these giant gaps. So if you look at the top left corner of your screen, you can see where I've cut out the discs. So that's the leftover pieces of where I cut out the original discs. And I can use that because it's got the perfect amount of curvature that's going to obviously match those other pieces that I've glued together. And I'm going to create these little pieces that you can see me kind of smashing with my fingers to try to get it to fit around the curvature of the sphere to fill in those gaps. So hopefully if you're actually going to make this project, you'll not make the same mistake. Uh, and you'll just create those disks a lot larger so that when you sand them down, you won't have this issue. But just in case you do, this did work fairly well. Where I've applied glue and then um, kind of pushing those extra pieces into those gaps. And then using pins to hold that in place. It would never stay in place, uh, even with the glue, if I didn't have those pins. So keeping all of those little pieces in place, and then once that glue has dried, I'm going to try to shave off those extra pieces. So once that glue is dried, I'm going to remove with a set of tweezers all of these pins that are holding that or those extra pieces in place. And then once I've got all of the pins removed, I'm going to inspect it. I've still got some areas that I need to fill in. Some of the areas I just filled in with glue, some of the smaller areas. But I'm going to take a razor blade and try to remove as best I can along the contours of the sphere those extra pieces that are filling in those gaps. So it doesn't look great at this point, doesn't look perfect, but that amount, or at least getting rid of a good chunk of those, uh, will help before I move on to uh, taking a piece of uh, sandpaper to it. So still removing with the razor blade, that top part. 
get it to look fairly smooth, but the goal obviously is to take a piece of sandpaper to this and try to create a seamless look. So I've removed all of those extra pieces and I'm going to start off with more of like a medium grit sandpaper and just work on trying to get rid of all of those rough edges. And I think it was actually a benefit to not have a proper sandpaper holder, one of those little rectangles, because I'm using the curvature of my hand, which is helping to like maintain the shape of that sphere when I sand. Otherwise you might em end up with like a semi-flat area if you had one of those proper uh, sandpaper holders. So I've moved on to a much finer grit of sandpaper and just a process of working this back and forth over and over again to try to get it as smooth as possible and trying to eliminate those seams between the layers. So working on the prototype, gonna go ahead and paint in where the dark spots are. So just having looked at reference photos of the moon, obviously, you can find ones on Pixabay or Pexels, other sites, you can find free pictures. And then putting in some lighter gray. And be sure and watch this intermission. All right, time for another intermission. This is where I go completely off topic and try to motivate those who haven't found God yet to start searching. Sometimes it's good to revisit an old message from another video you might not have heard. This video's topic is something no one, including some Christians, want to talk about. You rarely hear this in a Sunday church sermon, but of course it is in the Bible and that is the doctrine of hell. The concept of there being two destinations you could find yourself in upon passing away and leaving this world. I think there's a misconception that fear is always a bad thing, and yet we can see its benefits occasionally in our lives. If we're out hiking and we hear a mountain lion growl, that fear can push you into action to take steps in order for you to protect yourself, whether it be running or reaching for something to defend yourself. Fear can be a great motivator. Luke 12.4 begins, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after you've been killed, has authority to throw you in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, it makes God sound harsh, but in that scripture, God is the just judge. Just like a judge in a court of law can sentence someone to prison for the rest of their lives. Again, it sounds like God is being too harsh, but think of it in this way. When you were growing up, your parents did many things to help you. They had many responsibilities, one of which, and I realize how rough this sounds, but one of which was to prevent you from going to prison. Now, I also realize not all of us had great parents who were conscientious of this, but for the most part, parents knew in the back of their mind that if they didn't give you discipline and love and guidance, and multiple warnings in many forms over the years, and essentially give you some healthy fear of them, that you could wind up in prison someday. Now, what if a set of parents does all they can with what I've just mentioned? Discipline, love, guidance, trying to encourage the right friendships, etc. And their child, adult child at this point, still winds up in prison. While in prison, they go through torment and abuse, maybe from other inmates, guards, the warden, and possibly self-torment. Is it the parents giving that torment? The parents aren't there anymore in prison with their son or daughter. You've been separated from them. The parents tried to prevent their child from going to prison. It's the others in prison with the adult child 
that are distributing any torment. Prison is basically a quarantine for evil, so those in it don't affect or infect the rest of us. We would all agree prison is necessary or we would have chaos in society. Hell is a quarantine for evil after you pass away so those in it don't infect heaven. In the analogy, the parents represent God, the child represents humans, prison represents hell, society outside of prison represents heaven. God is not in hell tormenting anyone. He's trying to prevent people from going there, similar to the parents. It's interesting how he lets us see parallels to hell while we're here on earth. And in my opinion, prison is a good example. And some people ask, well, where does Jesus fit in? Why is he the only way? Jesus is the one who came into the courtroom, so to speak, and paid our fine. And some of you are like, what fine? All of the lies we've ever told, all of the things we've ever stolen, all of the other ungodly, unholy things we've ever said or done. In a court of law, when you lie under oath, or when it counts, you have to pay a debt to society. That's on earth, in our society. You can't not pay it. It has to be paid. In God's word, he's essentially saying it counts all the time, not just when you're under oath. All those times no one was looking, all those debts have to be paid for. Your case before God, the just judge, can legally be done away with because of Jesus paying our fine. In God's word, he's asking you to accept and believe in Jesus as having done this. And he's also asking you to let Jesus work through you in order for you to turn away from sin. Sin, something this world accepts as normal and commonplace, but in reality will lead to a separation from God, just like someone is separated from their parents if they go to prison. So you can see the benefits of learning about hell and having a healthy fear of God, just like you had a healthy fear of your parents. That healthy fear can motivate you and help in saving your soul from eternal separation from God. The point of these intermissions is really to motivate you to do your own research and realize that this topic is worthy of your time. Check out all of the amazing testimonies online of people who have been to heaven and hell and whose lives have been transformed from following Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. All right, so on the main project, I'm going to start to uh, looking at reference photos. You can see my phone there on the far left, looking at a photo of the moon, trying to map out with a ballpoint pen where those dark spots are. I'm not sure where or why I am using a ballpoint pen. I could have used a Sharpie for this, but it seemed to work. So trying to be as accurate as possible uh, if you put the time into you know drawing out realistically how big those spots are and you know where the sea of tranquility is, we're so used to looking up at the moon and seeing all those dark spots it'll just add to the the realism of your project if you take a little bit more time in drawing realistically those dark spots. Then I'm going to kind of color in a little bit just to make sure I'm not going to go over this with light gray. It can look a little confusing um, and just trying to make sure that I, I don't cover those up. So here I'm trying to test out in this larger scale how to create the craters for the main project. So I've got a screwdriver and just taking the other end of it that nobody ever uses uh, and trying to test out how it's going to uh, create a creator. So the XPS foam again really was good in uh, maintaining the shape that uh, is, is left behind by uh, you know pressing 
any one of these tools into it. So if anybody knows what this tool is actually meant for, no idea where this came from. Looks kind of like a hammer that G.I. Joe would use, uh, but I don't have any G.I. Joes. So if anybody knows what this is, leave me a comment. It does leave some pretty good craters in XPS foam. But using all kinds of things, using like the head of a nail, larger nail, and then using uh, smaller nails. Using a smaller nail there. And I would say I was, I was looking at reference photos, but I'm really not trying to create a perfectly, as in where are the actual craters um, located on the moon. I was just randomly applying craters. So here's a, a great way to apply some uh, texture using some tin foil, just kind of ball it up and you can quickly apply some texture there. So still experimenting with different ways. Got the uh, end of a paintbrush and creating craters that is. So I'm using again one of those leftover pieces from when I cut out the original discs and I'm going to cut out an extremely thin piece but in that shape uh, that the discs were cut out. I'm going to use that to fill in a healthy gap that happened in the middle of the piece. There are smaller gaps that, the, that this just didn't work for but this bigger gap here in the center I'm going to try to fill that in with actual foam instead of using glue, which there are other parts and gaps of this project that I just filled in with glue, but for this, decided to actually use foam. So trying to put it in there, cram it into that area, and then remove the excess with a razor blade. So here's a uh, leftover piece of, I've just placed glue on this for years and it has, uh, it has this texture to it. So this is basically just dried up glue and it's basically a, an aggressive, more aggressive way of applying texture to XPS foam. So this will come in handy when I've got dried glue patches that I need to create texture in. So there are, speaking of that, uh, other areas that were just too thin to put uh, strips of foam in to fill in those gaps. And so I'm just using the same glue that I used to create this project or glue this project together. There will be a list of materials in the uh, section below this video. So one way of trying to hide those seams where I did have to fill it in with foam or glue is to try to have a crater like on, like literally on one of those seams uh, to try to break that look of it not having texture or craters on it in hopes to uh, blend it in with the rest of the, the surface area. So I've got it down to a point where I'm going to start painting it, even though I did go back at this point or after this and created uh, or filled in more gaps and applied more texture and then had to repaint that. But just painting on a uh, light to medium gray and all of those areas that uh, have that shade and then working on the uh, darker spots a little bit later. So starting to fill in those darker spots, making sure I'm still checking reference photos here and there. So as you can see in the middle of your screen there, there's still, even though I filled that in with glue, you can still see a little bit of a seam. And I want to try to, even though I've already painted this, 
So I'm taking glue and I'm gonna try to fill in those extremely small gaps. So this is just up to you how far you wanna take this level of detail and trying to hide those seams. So once those areas of glue that you filled in seams are dry, I'm gonna take that piece that has all the dried up glue with the heavy texture. I'm gonna to try to apply some texture to that glue in hopes to try to blend it in with the rest of the surface area. And then once all of that texture is applied to all of those areas where I had to reapply glue, I'm gonna paint over those with that exact same lighter gray. There's another spot. So hopefully it's looking more seamless at this point. So going back in and trying to refine all of those areas that have the darker spots. And one thing I noticed with looking at those reference photos of the moon is that uh, usually there was like a very smooth uh, transition between the darker spots and the lighter spots of the moon. So I've got my brush kind of in like a, it's an older brush, uh, like a stippled look where you can you know, blend the two shades together, as you can see there. You can also go back in with some lighter gray or darker gray, using a light gray here to paint over some of that darker gray to uh, refine the shapes. And sometimes you're refining the negative space of like what's in between the darker spots. And I noticed that in looking at the reference photos that the darker spots had quite a few different shades of uh, this dark gray. So applying some darker gray to the uh, dark gray spots and also later applying some lighter gray. And it really provides a lot more depth uh, and realism to your project. And then dry brushing on a very light gray. What this will do is really bring out the texture of those craters. and dry brushing the dark side of the moon. There's not too many dark spots on the dark side of the moon. Basically the side of the moon we never see, but uh, just going ahead and fleshing out the project and dry brushing that side of the moon brings out those craters. And dry brushing some of the darker spots. So those dark spots are really looking a lot more complex. You can see darker grays and lighter grays going on, hopefully enhancing the, the realism of the project. And going in with a smaller brush, kind of stippling redefining some of those edges. And sometimes dry brushing and then removing some of the paint with your thumb or finger can help in creating a very subtle look. And there you have it, Moon Diorama. So be sure and check out the rest of the channel for all of the other landscape videos. And as always, thank you for watching.